Have you ever heard of GMOs? The answer is probably yes. GMOs are given lots of media coverage, and you may have seen this topic in other science courses that you've taken. But just because we might know of GMOs does not mean that we actually know what a GMO is. Take a moment and try to define a GMO in your own words. A GMO is also known as a genetically modified organism, which is an organism whose genetic material has been altered using genetic engineering techniques. And genetic engineering is the process of manipulating an organism's genes by methods other than natural reproduction. This means that GMOs do not include simply plants and animals that have been bred to produce more food faster. Rather, a GMO is actually an organism that has had alterations made intentionally to its genetic code to produce what is deemed by the genetic engineer as improvements. Some of these changes cause organisms to grow larger and produce more food, while others make them more resistant to things that might eat them or harm the organism being farmed. Today, we will consider, among other things, the process of genetic engineering, including its rules and GMOs, and then examine some ways in which it can be used. However, GMOs are a controversial topic. Some are concerned that GMOs could be dangerous to produce and consume, and are wary of their use, while others believe that GMOs are the best way to have dominion over Earth and meet people's needs for food. But no matter what position you eventually come to, as it relates to GMOs, it will be important that your position is well informed. So pause the program and briefly research and write a one-paragraph summary of what you learn about GMOs. Hopefully you learned a little about the complex genetic engineering that's involved in creating GMOs. But in addition to using genetics in agriculture and health, genetics is also used for detective work. So this lesson, our essential question, is how can DNA be used to find out who committed a crime? And while we will discuss this essential question a bit this lesson, we will mostly be focusing on genetic engineering for the bulk of the lesson, and we'll begin to learn about alternative uses for genetics at the end of this lesson, and then explore the application to police work more thoroughly in a lab in a couple of lessons. So first, we'll learn how genes are separated, cataloged, and rearranged. Then we'll learn how scientists change DNA. And then lastly, we'll consider possible ways that we could use genetic engineering to better exercise dominion over God's world. So how are genes separated, cataloged, and rearranged? In your reading for today, you learned about the work that Francis Collins did to sequence the human genome. When sequencing the human genome claimed completion in 2003, it was deservedly big news. But the human genome wasn't the first to be sequenced, and certainly wasn't the last either. Scientists sequenced the first genome, that of a virus, in 1977, and as of 2020, more than 300,000 genomes have been sequenced. But what exactly do we mean when we talk about genome sequencing? Well, a genome is the full set of genetic information coded in an organism's DNA. And sequencing is the process of determining the order of nucleotides in an organism's DNA. But the work of separating, cataloging, and rearranging genes are all part of a field of genomics. Genomics is the study of genomes, or an organism's full set of genetic information coded in its DNA. In your reading, you learned that scientists have studied the genomes of a variety of organisms, ranging from the almost 5 million base pairs in E. coli to the 3.1 billion base pairs in human DNA. And in their study, they found that the genomes of any two different people share 99.99% of the exact same information. However, when your book said that the DNA of two people are 99.99% the same, it would be good to give this number some mathematical context. The human genome contains about 3 billion base pairs, so a 0.01 difference adds up to about 300,000 base pairs, which hopefully you recognize is still a huge difference. Now, while the Human Genome Project was well-funded and was completed with great care, this cannot be said for all genomic attempts. Take, for example, the evolutionary claim that humans and chimp DNA is only 2% different. This claim is based off an attempt to do the same thing for chimpanzees. First, this number is frequently changing and in recent years has been reduced to as little as 0.6 to 1.5% difference, which confirms that clearly someone somewhere made some mistakes. But what kind of mistakes were made? Well, for starters, their work was rushed and it used a completely different mapping strategy called whole genome shotgun sequencing and it used the human genome as a template, reusing human genes while omitting or leaving out significant segments of DNA that were different and could not be placed. 
But even if it turns out that somehow the questionable cataloging attempt for chimpanzees yielded accurate results, we should not be concerned by the claim of a 2% difference between humans and chimpanzees, because this still means a difference of 60 million base pairs. And this deflated number would still require a minimum of 40 million total separate mutation events to occur in just the right way. Additionally, consider that if humans, which have only difference of 0.01%, have as much variety as is evident, then a 2% difference would reveal 200 times as much difference. So the evolutionary claim that humans and chimp DNA is only 2% difference should be seen for what it is, a lofty argument that's based on questionable interpretations of questionable data. However, some similarities between animals and people is not shocking, since many organisms must create many of the same proteins to stay alive. But returning to the Human Genome Project, about 1.5% of the human genome contains codes for making proteins. Some of the functions of the remainders are known, such as the codes that control genes, and some consist of repetitive sequences. But the exact function of much of the non-protein coding DNA is not yet known. Still, mapping the human genome has yielded concrete benefits. Through this work, scientists have been able to trace some genetic disorders back to their DNA roots. Yet even though we do not understand everything going on in DNA yet, there's still a strong desire to engineer genes that can alter organisms in useful ways. Genetic engineering is done one of two ways. Either DNA is removed, altered, and reinserted, or DNA is removed from one kind of organism with a desirable trait and then reinserted to DNA to form a transgenic organism. A transgenic organism is an organism containing genes that have been introduced from a different kind of organism. Or in everyday English, a transgenic organism is a genetic Frankenstein's monster of sorts. But this method of creating GMOs is far more efficient, because unlike grafting wanted traits from one organism to another, the DNA itself is being altered. And this altered DNA is passed down through the generations if the GMO is still capable of reproduction. Which it usually isn't. In fact though, this method is so efficient that even some farmers who want to avoid growing GMOs can still accidentally wind up growing plants that have been pollinated from GMOs and now carry these altered genes. As of the time of recording this lesson, 94% of all soybeans grown are GMOs, and 90% of all corn grown are GMOs. Perhaps you can see why this might make one concerned if they were skeptical about the safety of GMOs, but this is beside the point. Before scientists were able to create GMOs successfully, they needed a way to read DNA. First scientists use a method like you used in lesson 45 to extract DNA from the gametes of organisms. Then the DNA is divided into pieces using a restriction enzyme. A restriction enzyme is an enzyme used to cut DNA into pieces at specific places in the DNA sequence. This leaves an uncombined base pair at the end of each snipped piece of DNA, and the uncombined base pairs are called sticky ends since they're available for pairing and want to stick to other DNA pieces. Then computers are used to sort the DNA fragments, usually using the human genome as a template to determine the order of the nucleotide fragments within it. Geneticists will also use an automated sequencing machine to help them sequence billions of base pairs. In addition, some geneticists use computers to compare sections of the genome to find areas that overlap. They can then use this information to figure out the original sequence of the DNA. Then, once this information is cataloged, scientists can work to mark which nucleotides are part of which genes and are responsible for producing specific proteins. But how do scientists change DNA? To put it simply, scientists make several copies of the genes that they're wanting to work with, and then they paste these genes back into a DNA strand, where it will then be read, used, and reproduced by the organism with the altered DNA. So, the first step is to use a laboratory process called polymerase chain reaction to quickly generate many copies of a piece of DNA for medical or research purposes. In essence, the polymerase chain reaction is a process used to add primers in front of genes that we want duplicated. Once this is done, the cell does the rest of the work in duplicating the segment of DNA. Scientists can then gather the duplicated genes that they want to use in other cells and insert them into the strands of DNA to form recombinant DNA. And recombinant DNA are DNA molecules produced in a laboratory by combining sequences of DNA from different sources yielding a new sequence not normally found in any genome. 
Thus, recombinant DNA is the customized DNA that is produced when geneticists introduce genes into an original strand of DNA. To create recombinant DNA in a prokaryote, the altered DNA that contains genes that code for desired phenotypes are inserted into bacterial plasmids by using restriction enzymes to open the plasmid and then add the new piece of DNA. This is often done because bacteria can be converted into itty-bitty useful disposable pharmacies when the recombinant DNA instructs the cells to create something that's not needed by the bacterium, such as insulin. This strategy is not unique to us, though. God designed viruses with a similar ability to rewrite DNA in cells to create more viruses, so it makes sense that we could do this to create useful molecules as well. So, now that we understand how scientists read and alter DNA, how can we use genetic engineering to better exercise dominion over God's world? This is a tricky question, because the degree to which you're willing to utilize genetic engineering to solve real-world problems is dependent on how much you trust those doing the genetic engineering. It's exceedingly evident that genetic engineering is an incredibly powerful tool that enables us to rewrite how organisms grow and behave on a cellular level. However, there's also much that we don't know about DNA, or how these changes that we're making to one phenotype in an organism may impact other phenotypes. For example, if we design a plant to survive harsher poisons, then we may use harsher poisons to kill pests. But this also means that the plant will be able to absorb more and more of those poisons without dying, and could thus result in the consumer eating more of the herbicides and pesticides that were sprayed on them. Note, I'm not saying that GMOs are bad, I'm a huge fan of GMOs, but we must consider what hidden costs are lurking before transitioning to relying on GMOs for food, cures, and gene therapy. And at this time, we're unsure of the long-term effects that using and eating genetically modified organisms will have on our environment, culture, and even our health. You already know how GMOs are used for plant-based foods like soy, corn, and sugar, but there are many other animals that have been genetically modified, although at the time of recording, these are not authorized to be used for food. You also learned that bacteria are genetically modified to produce medicines. This sort of work is genius because it's easy to test the products and check that they're creating the correct proteins. And if the bacteria is killed by this, we're no worse for it. But it turns out that we can also become GMOs ourselves when we use gene therapy to fix genetic disorders or diseases. While this is a high-risk use for genetic engineering, it also can yield high rewards. Many individuals have genetic disorders and diseases that are slowly killing them in painful ways, and gene therapy can often be the solution needed by people who are suffering. Gene therapy is the use of genetic engineering to treat genetic disorders or diseases. Gene therapy relies on a microscopic vehicle called vectors to deliver recombinant DNA and vectors can be either bacteria or viruses, called bacteriophages, that attach to certain bacteria or cells. Scientists use vectors to transfer new genetic material to an organism in order to change its DNA. After this new genetic information has been inserted, the recombinant DNA produces the desired effect. Sometimes recombinant DNA produces proteins needed to reverse a disease or counteract a problem. However, gene therapy is not foolproof. Sometimes the treatment doesn't last for long periods of time, or even work at all. When this happens, boosters must be administered regularly to ensure that the effects remain. One popular example of this was the use of the COVID-19 vaccines that used the same process with the stated purpose of fighting the viral pandemic. Additionally, while gene therapy works for some individuals, others can reject the vector completely, which may cause serious side effects. Additionally, gene therapy can fail to be effective because geneticists don't completely understand the disease and all the genes that are related to it. And this is why historically, all forms of gene therapy had to undergo rigorous testing prior to implementation. Of course, with exception to the COVID-19 vaccine, which did not have time to undergo the same set of testing for obvious reasons. But that's not, to, but that's not the focus of this lesson. Rather, returning to the idea of genetic diseases, it may be easy to assume that genetic diseases are evidence that God doesn't exist or doesn't care about his creation. But is this assumption correct? From a biblical worldview, we can see that diseases such as SCID are evidence of the fallen condition of our world, a consequence of sin. That's to say that it's part of the general consequence of sin, the curse that's on the entire world. We should not incorrectly assume, like Job's friends did, that every misfortune is God personally doling out his wrath on us personally. Rather, it's part of a curse that we are all under, 
Thankfully, genetic engineering is a tool that God has equipped us with that we can use to exercise wise dominion and show care and compassion for God's image bearers as we seek to serve God in a sin-cursed world. However, this is not the only way that genetics can help us have dominion over aspects of God's creation. Another important use for genetics is identifying lost family members or the remains of people killed in natural disasters or accidents. DNA fingerprinting can also be used to diagnose inherited disorders in newborns, such as cystic fibrosis, hemophilia, sickle cell disease, Huntington's disease, and some types of Alzheimer's. And DNA fingerprinting is a technique used to identify an individual that's based on sequences in his or her DNA. The earliest forms of DNA fingerprinting developed in the 1980s involved a process called geoelectrophoresis. Basically, this process involved the use of restriction enzymes to cut a strand of DNA into fragments every time two specific nucleotide base pairs appeared. These fragments are then applied to a gel cover plate attached to a power source. When an electrical current is applied, the DNA fragments are sorted as they travel down the plate, with the longest strands traveling slower and staying closer to the power supply, while the shortest fragments migrate furthest away. Bands of different lengths of DNA are revealed by staining the finished gel. Today, DNA fingerprinting looks for unique patterns in an individual's DNA to identify them using this process. Since 1987, when DNA fingerprinting was first used in forensics, hundreds of court cases have been decided with the help of DNA fingerprinting, clearing the innocent and incriminating the guilty. Although, as you'll soon learn, fingerprinting can also wrongly incriminate a person. So it's important that it's used in combination with other detective practices. But again, this is the subject of a later lesson. So, in conclusion, we can see that God has given us DNA, which is not just necessary for life, but also useful as a tool that can be used to better have dominion over God's world, if properly used with restraint and caution. Well, this lesson we learned a little bit about how DNA can be used to find out who committed a crime. This is done by examining sequences of DNA left behind at crime scenes, which are then analyzed using electrophoresis. This process sorts DNA fragments by size and then stains them to create banding patterns that are as unique to individuals as fingerprints, hence the name. This lesson we also learned how genes are separated, cataloged, and rearranged, and how scientists are able to change DNA. And lastly, we learned that genetic engineering can be used to better exercise dominion over God's world if done with great caution and restraint. But did I tell you about my buddy who tried to sell empty seed packets as GMOs? Yep, he claimed that the plants were genetically modified to be seedless. He wasn't wrong, it's just they were also plantless.